Peter B. Collins. News and comment. It's Wednesday, September 21st, 2016. This free daily podcast is now available on YouTube. Share that information with your friends, will you? The efforts to restore the full effect of the Fourth Amendment right against unauthorized search and seizure gaining a little traction today, just a little. Last week, uh, we delivered an in-depth interview with my friend and colleague, Jason Leopold, who is now at Vice News. And for years, Jason has been using the Freedom of Information Act, backed up by lawsuits filed by a Washington attorney who deserves credit. His name is Jeffrey Light. And today, they uh, not only shared a victory, but got some fruits of that victory as a federal judge released a list of all sealed requests made in Washington in 2012 for the rapidly growing form of government electronic surveillance that we call Stingray and Dirt Box. And I have sounded the alarm about Stingray, this surveillance system that's a briefcase-sized device. It simulates a cell phone tower. It causes every phone within radius to check in with it. And while the government maintains that they only collect metadata in this process, we know that Stingray is capable of much more. And we know that the government has been really uh, evasive in the way they have used Stingray, the way they have avoided telling courts, including judges, that evidence was derived from this illegal search device. And there are substantive issues about whether government agencies can use these devices without a warrant. And now the courts are uh, starting to line up. Some courts find this uh, is okay, and others rule against it. So uh, Jason Leopold deserves credit here because he filed a, a suit back in 2012 and he asked for information about these, uh, the use of these devices. And so it is uh, nice to see that uh, District Judge, Chief Judge Beryl Howell uh, identified 234 law enforcement applications from the year 2012 uh, that investigators filed seeking to collect the date, time, duration, and source of communications to and from a targeted person, phone number, or email address, and this is now extended to instant messaging and social networks. The applications were uh, under an arcane, old standard called pen register and trap and trace orders. And so we are now seeing at least the big picture of how these devices are used. Now, prosecutors say that they would unseal information about the type of crime that was being investigated, but not which agency sought the order. They also won't tell us specifics about the case or material that would identify individuals, targeted numbers, or service providers. So this is going to be, you know, a a, a view from 5,000 feet, if you will. But it's better than no view at all. And civil liberties groups and advocates for government transparency have raised alarms that new surveillance methods, coupled with computing and storage capabilities, enable authorities to use the laws that uh, go back to the crank telephone (laughs) to uh, sweep up a lot of digital data in the modern age. And the Supreme Court ruled two years ago, unanimously, that police in general must obtain a warrant to search your cell phone. But if they don't touch your cell phone, they invade it electronically without leaving footprints or other evidence, well, that is another picture that uh, certainly violates our privacy and I think fundamentally is a general warrant in violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. So in March, a Maryland appeals court admonished police and prosecutors for lying to the courts by using the old law to justify secretly deploying the new technology. And police seeking a surveillance order under the statute must tell a court only how the information thereafter is relevant to an investigation. So it's not at the level, the legal threshold for a search warrant. And in general, the courts go along. Now, this federal judge said using the simulators without first getting a search warrant amounted to constitutionally intrusive conduct. Now, that seems to be a polite way of saying they are just (laughs) uh, bulldozing the Fourth Amendment. So kudos to Jason Leopold. 
He is a dogged investigative reporter who <laughs> really scores uh, uh, quite often, and I'm glad to see it. Uh, a little bit of data. Applications under the old law to use the new technology quadruple in one year from 2012 to 2013, jumping from 137 to 564. Now, this is just in Washington, D.C., and again, since they're not going to tell us which agencies were responsible, uh, we have to assume that they're federal agencies, that this is not the local law enforcement in the District of Columbia. But I honestly don't have enough uh, information to uh, say for sure one way or the other on that. Also, uh, Jeff Light, the attorney, noted that in Houston, surveillance requests are maintained separately from regular criminal and civil dockets. They're filed on paper, sealed in paper envelopes, and tucked away in a vault somewhere. And so this kind of uh, criminal behavior... That's what I would call it, criminal behavior by law enforcement. Other people might be more polite and say, well, it's unethical, it's, uh, it's stretching the law, it's extra legal. Hey, when cops commit crimes, that's what they're called, crimes. Now, I want to acknowledge that recently listener Terry Paris sent me an email she listens to the podcast regularly, and I appreciate that. She's a subscriber as well. And Terry said, you know, Peter, the news is so negative. And when you can, can you look for ways to report on people working for change? And Terry's not asking for, you know, stories about uh, pets and, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, silly stuff or trivial things. And so, Terry, I'm talking to you today with these next two items. Local officials in 11 cities around this country have launched a campaign today to crack down on the unsanctioned police use of surveillance equipment, especially devices that imitate cell phone towers. That's your stingray. That's your dirt box. In partnership with 17 different organizations from the ACLU to the NAACP and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Employees of local governments around the nation will distribute model legislation. Take that, Alec. And this model legislation, there's a little bit of risk involved here, I have to say, as I look at this. They want to return authority over spying to local elected officials. Not the feds, not the FBI, not the Joint Terrorism Task Force, not your local police chief, but the city council or the county government. Now, in my county, this would be a plus because I know most of the elected officials here. I've lived here quite a while, and I don't think that they're out to violate my rights. But if you give local authority in Ferguson, Missouri, in a little town in Texas where Sandra Bland got sideways with the law and committed suicide, we were told, well, I'm a little uncomfortable because of the uneven application of these kinds of issues at a local level. But still, I would rather have the transparency, and I'd rather see it on my city council agenda than to have it remain in the darkened corners of police agencies. So I think that this is a, a, an interesting effort. At minimum, it's going to draw attention to the uh, widespread use of surveillance, and it's not aimed at terrorists. That's what we've been misled to believe, that these you know, devices and the militar militarization of our police departments are really just to combat terrorism. I don't believe that's true, and probably you don't either. Now, there's one other story here, Terry Paris, that I want to share with you, and I've been saving this for a, a few days. It was published on September 1st by the Bill of Rights Defense Committee and uh, DDF, which is the organization that they merged with. And I'm linking to it so you can read it for yourselves. It uh, celebrates the work of the Oakland Privacy Working Group in Oakland, California. And just a few years ago, there were plans to set up a big uh, a control room, a surveillance center which would cobble together all of the police cameras, the highway cameras, the private surveillance cameras, 
and turn Oakland into another wired town. And Oakland privacy took up the cause, embraced the Constitution, and in particular the Fourth Amendment. And an article about them uh, uh, goes like this. The Fourth Amendment protection clearly touches on a technology that collects data indiscriminately, whether it's a closed-circuit TV camera identifying license plates or cell site simulators like Stingray, which intercept all the cell phones within range. That means not only identifying the phone, but collecting the metadata, the duration of calls, who's phoning who, and who is sending and receiving messages. And so the Oakland Privacy Working Group is described as transpartisan. And they note that uh, one uh, individual said from the other end of the political spectrum here in California, the lefties, the progressives, were f trying to force the conservatives to reveal their donors and membership roles of Proposition 8. And we're like, no, we already decided this issue. It's like we didn't learn much. Well, <laughs> now here's a case where I don't actually agree with these people. I, I don't think that the information about who donated to Proposition 8 which was to ban same-sex marriage after it had already been found uh, uh, constitutional here in California. Uh, I don't think that that was an appropriate privacy issue, and I frankly don't think it has anything to do with uh, electronic surveillance. But uh, it shows that even people who don't agree with me on Proposition 8 are alarmed at the expansion of electronic surveillance. And I happily will coalesce with people who disagree with me on almost everything else if we can form some meaningful effort to uh, reestablish the full force of the Fourth Amendment here in the United States of America. Now, you know, the FBI spent about a million three. That's what we're told to hack the San Bernardino iPhone. And I've mentioned this before, Bill Binney, Kirk Wiebe, the NSA veterans, when I spoke with them, gosh, it's been about a month ago now, said, you know, we don't believe that whole charade. We think they'd already hacked that phone, and they were just looking to use this as the pretext to establish a legal precedent and to force Apple to back down. Well, now, a student at Cambridge University spending about $100 has put together a system that successfully hacked an iPhone 5C, and he says it'll work on the newer phones as well. And let's give credit. This uh, researcher's name is Sergei, see if I can say this, Skorobogatov. Ah, I said it, Skorobogatov. <laughs> anyway, he developed a system called NAND, NAND mirroring, and basically he takes the subject phone, he clones it, and then he just runs a, a, a sequence of potential passwords against the clones. And when one of the clones opens up with the password that works, he then applies that password to the original phone. Now, James Comey, back in, uh, when was it, February and March, when they were pursuing this struggle, he said that that uh, approach was unworkable. But... Skora Bogodov says, because I can create as many clones as I want, I can repeat the process many, many times until the passcode is found. He says the technique works for all iPhones up to number six. And he said that with more sophisticated hardware, he can hack sixes and sevens. Now, uh, number one, this shows the idiocy of the FBI. But number two, it shows that despite... Apple's efforts to harden encryption on iPhones, that they are not invulnerable. They may be resistant, but they're not invulnerable. And please keep that in mind. The FBI is also getting rejection from a third federal court as a judge rules that a mass hack by the FBI, which captured thousands of computers based on a single warrant, was illegal. Now, this is the Playpen case, a child pornography site. It was on the dark web, meaning you could only access it when you had an encrypted uh, uh, an encryption system like Tor. And the FBI found a vulnerability there, and then it inserted malware in all of the people's uh, systems who visited Playpen. 
Then they moved Playpen to a federal government server in Virginia and continued to operate the site in order to create a dragnet to capture child porn users. And this gets way into the weeds, but the basis for this is not a law. It is a policy that can be overruled by the Congress, but uh, it's unlikely the Congress will act. And it's in the federal court procedure policies. And they've made a change in that policy based on the blunders the FBI made in the playpen case. So going forward, what that means is that a single warrant issued in one jurisdiction will be applied in multiple jurisdictions. Today, right now, that is being rejected by the courts. But in December, when the new rule is supposed to take effect, well, playpen would be able to go forward. Now, three courts have ruled in favor of defendants rejecting the FBI uh, uh, evidence, while 11 have upheld the government's warrant. This is clearly a case that should come before the Supreme Court. But, of course, the Supreme Court is not uh, fully staffed right now. And so it really is anybody's guess whether the uh, change is going to go into effect. It's unlikely, I think, that... The Congress or the lame duck session will take this up. And so even if you have no sympathy for people who view child pornography, this is a a very broad and intrusive policy that could be used against people who aren't looking at child pornography, but who are simply doing things that are unpopular uh, with our government. Every day I like to pause for a second and thank the folks who support my work with your subscriptions to the Peter B. Collins podcast. People like Nick Yaksic, Bob Donjakur, he's on a cross-country bike ride right now, and I see his daily updates on Facebook. Susan Lundgren, she's a generous supporter, and George Reeves as well. Thanks to each of you, and I want to invite others to come forward Just this week, I have, uh, for whatever reason, had three uh, subscribers cancel. And so I'd like you to step up and replace them so that at least my revenue from the podcast stays stable. And don't worry, I'm not making a fortune here. It barely covers the costs of uh, the Internet and all the other things that go into putting a podcast together. But I do appreciate the support that people extend, and I invite you to help out, too. You go to PeterBCollins.com, you click on Menu, you pull down, click on Become a Subscriber, and that takes you to the sign-up page, and it's easy from there. Yesterday, I was scratching my head and saying, why won't they tell us who was responsible for the despicable destruction of 18 out of 31 trucks in the U.N. relief convoy that was on its way into Aleppo, Syria, on Monday night? And now what we have is a round of finger pointing. And once again, the United States says it knows because we have evidence that we don't present that Russia was responsible. Now, Russia says, no, we didn't have any jets in the area. Syria says uh, we don't have any jets to fly. We use old helicopters with barrel bombs. Uh, Turkey has aerial assets in the area, but nobody appears to be uh, suspecting the Turks. And so this now becomes a kind of international uh, puzzle. There are some people who believe uh, that this nighttime raid in an area where there were no lights on the road was not actually conducted from the air. The Russians seem to blame al-Qaeda or uh, Islamic State fighters for destroying the convoy. That could be true. I mean, they're capable of a whole range of, uh, of ugly crimes that, you know, mere mortals or, you know, humans would not even contemplate. But, you know, we've got all kinds of radar, satellite, drones covering the area. And for the United States to claim that it has evidence but not reveal it, is just another silly game. And from what we know, uh, an American official is blaming Russian aircraft for the strike. The Russian military has denied that Russia or Syria had anything to do with the attacks, and 
They're showing videos that they claim uh, buttress their position. A TASS spokesman said, We carefully studied the video recordings of the so-called activists from the scene and found no signs that any munitions hit the convoy. Everything shown in the video is the direct consequence of the cargo that caught fire. Uh, I have a hard time accepting that. But TASS then issued a later statement suggesting the convoy had been hit by a terrorist truck with a mortar. So we'll uh, continue to question this and look for answers for you here at the PBC Podcast. Now, here's the next round of incoherent policy from the Obama administration. And I want to put this in context. Twice now in the past year, the U.S. has made deals with Turkey to get Turkey more involved in the war in Syria and particularly fighting against the Islamic State. And each time Turkey pledges to do that, and then they turn around and they pummel the Kurds who live in Turkey, also Kurds in Syria, also Kurds in Iraq. And so now the Obama administration is considering a high-risk strategy to directly arm the Syrian Kurds to fight against the Islamic State. Now this will surely piss off the Turks and We keep thinking that Turkey is going to really come into the fray here and turn things around. And so to me, this is just more incoherent plotting in a place where we have no business to begin with. We never should have attempted to topple the so-called regime, the government of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. And we've never really admitted the folly of that effort. Then the civil war there created the vacuum that allowed the Islamic State to gain a big foothold in Raqqa. And the plans to take Raqqa back have been further delayed because of the uh, confusion related to Turkey and the intentions of the Turkish fighters. And just the other day, we told you that we've got American uh, advisors who are embedded with these Turkish forces in northern Syria. And so I'm sorry if this offends you and and reduces the conversation to uh, a crude level, but the only term that really describes what's going on in Syria is clusterfuck. And the U.S. seems unable to exit the scrum and has no imagination, no vision of how that could change things. And so we're just further mired in for the duration. Well, everybody knows more now about Ahmad Rahami. What's interesting is we've seen a notebook. We've seen some information from his father, but they haven't busted out his uh, Facebook or other social media connections. Maybe he was silent there. I don't know. But what I'm fascinated by is that the central report is that Ahmad Rahami was inspired to commit his uh, bombings in Manhattan and in New Jersey over the past weekend. And he was inspired, we're told, by Osama bin Laden, and Anwar al-Awlaki. And what do those two men have in common? Uh, Many things. They were Islamic radicals. They embraced violence, jihad, as a way to advance their goals. But they also are the only two people on the planet who were chosen for martyrdom by Barack Obama. And we know that President Obama, on these individual strikes against bin Laden, there was a whole drama about whether or not to attack Abbottabad, Pakistan. And then, five years ago, next week, the U.S. used a drone to take out a Laki in Yemen. And while a lot of high fives, a lot of self-congratulation, a lot of political grandstanding over the execution of these two. What we did was make them martyrs. 
and their inspiration will outlive <clears throat> the, uh, the imprint, the impact that they made while they were alive. And this is, I think, a gross miscalculation that our, the American consciousness never pauses to consider. We're so busy, you know, patting ourselves on the back. We took out bin Laden. And we killed that traitor, Alaki. But we are oblivious to how that makes those people look to young radicals. And I don't know enough about this guy, uh, Rahami, to claim that he was radicalized. The notebook is pretty incriminating. But we know he was contacted by the FBI after his father turned him in two years ago. And while the FBI said they looked him over and they declined to put a, uh, an informant on him and set him up for some crime, it's possible, and we may learn this because Rahami has survived this episode, it's possible that he was really radicalized by his contact with the FBI. And, of course, that's just another notion that we never entertain because the good guys never do wrong. <sighs> I think you can tell how much it frustrates me. And I've linked in the show file to this podcast to Scott Shane's piece in last Sunday's New York Times. He's the one who wrote the book Objective Troy about the killing of Alaki. And you can look up my podcast interview with Scott Shane. I found it very interesting. I learned quite a bit. And Shane basically thinks that killing a Lockie was justified. And I argue that even if it's justified, they never made the case publicly or legally. And the net effect is they created a martyr who will continue to inspire people for uh, a, an unpredictable future period of time. Lindsey Graham wants Rahami to be treated as an enemy combatant, and I think this is just downright ludicrous. And, you know, Lindsey Graham's not even up for re-election this year. He's not pandering for votes. He's just being an idiot. Because all of the federal officials and others who have spoken about the case say that they can't find anybody so far who helped Rahami make the bombs, who conspired with him, who gave him orders to conduct these activities. There is zero evidence of any outside influence on Rahami. But that doesn't stop Lindsey Graham. I hope the Obama administration will consider holding Rahami as an enemy combatant for intelligence-gathering purposes. The suspect, based upon his currently reported actions, clearly is a candidate for enemy combatant status. That is just bullshit. <laughs> He's an American citizen. That doesn't, you know, I, 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 okay, now we go to the problematic police shootings in recent days. First in Charlotte, where demonstrators clashed with police officers in riot gear late into the night. Last night, officers shot and killed a black man while trying to serve a warrant on another person at an apartment complex. Keith Scott is the black man who was killed by a black police officer, Brent Lee Vinson. And the authorities say that he was reaching for a gun. Now, a little more detail. They claim that uh, this uh, guy had been sitting in a car as they went to an apartment building to arrest somebody else. And the uh, police chief, who is also African-American, Kerr Putney, said he did have a weapon when he exited the vehicle. Officers were giving loud, clear verbal commands. The suspect exited the vehicle with a handgun, threatening officers. Now, it's interesting because uh, members of his family, the victim's family, Keith Scott, had already gotten out the narrative that he was holding a book and not a gun. Now, I haven't seen evidence of this gun. We uh, So far, I just have the chief's uh, assertions to go with. But this uh, is, you know, confusing, raises serious questions. Why did they have to shoot to kill? 
But it remains a puzzle, and I hope that things will settle down in Charlotte and that we'll have a true, credible investigation into those events. Meanwhile, across the country in Tulsa, the other shooting of, an, uh, of a black man, uh, this one, uh, Terrence Crutcher, aged 40, clearly unarmed, shot by a white police officer, a female. And the new details we're learning are that the police officer who fired the shot, her name is Betty Shelby, her husband was in the police helicopter that was hovering over the scene. And some of the footage included radio chatter. We don't know that this came from her husband, but one of the people in the chopper said, time for a taser, and then said, that looks like a bad dude, too. Probably on something. Now remember, Terrence Kutcher called the cops himself. His car stalled out on the highway, and he was looking for help, and why he was treated like a criminal suspect. Officers drawing weapons is beyond me. And finally today, Ross Douthat is a conservative columnist at the New York Times. And I want to report his perspective to you because it kind of surprised me. Now, I am a consumer of political comedy on television. I watch Bill Maher, I watch The Daily Show, I watch Samantha Bee, I watch John Oliver, and just about anything else that is political and, you know, has the potential for a laugh. And Ross Douthat is arguing that the liberal culture of late-night television, which has always, he acknowledges, tilted leftward, is so far to the left these days that it is alienating conservatives and pushing them into political action. And Douthat writes, Some of them have better lines than others, some joke more or hector less. But to flip from Colbert's winsome liberalism to Seth Meyers' class clown liberalism to Samantha Bee's blue-stocking feminism to John Oliver and Trevor Noah's lectures on American benightedness is to enter an echo chamber from which the imagination struggles to escape. Now, I will concede that there are very few conservative humorists in American media. There was a conservative uh, attempt at comedy on the Fox News Channel. It may still be there. I can't tell you the name of it. I've seen it like on a, a Saturday evening. But it is fair to say that most of the humor is dominated by people with views that are pretty similar to mine. And what Douthat closes with here is that outside the liberal tent, the feeling of being suffocated by the left's cultural dominance is turning voting Republican into an act of cultural rebellion. <laughs> His final comment is, the new cultural orthodoxy is sufficiently stifling to leave many Americans looking to the voting booth as a way to register uh, dissent. Well, I don't think that's very funny, Ross. I, I, I just don't think that's funny. Let me know what you think. And thanks for listening. I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep smiling